Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Israel, welcome back for another conversation. Today we're going to be looking at the Omri dynasty, which is, of course, the first time we really have the biblical text, the archaeology, and the, you know, the extra-biblical material coming together to tell a story that is familiar to us. And it's a great story. <laughs> we have the first really significant Israelite dynasty including Judah, Judah and Israel combined. We have a strong dynasty in the first half of the ninth century, ruling between around 880 and 840 BC for 40 years. And uh, we have uh, four monarchs, some of them, three of them are well known, I suppose, Omri. Uh, the Omrites are called after him. He's the founder and the founder also of the uh, capital Samaria. And then, of course, King Ahab, uh, who was a very strong figure on the arena of the Levant of the time. And also King Joram, I think, uh, also because of the fall of the dynasty at the end. So, uh, um, and, and the northern kingdom in their time was, in fact, uh, the contender for hegemony over the entire Levant, or at least southern Levant. Uh, the other power really... Uh, playing uh, uh, in the arena was Damascus. So Damascus and the Northern Kingdom, they are the powerful two uh, kingdoms of the time. Uh, and as you said, uh, indeed, uh, for the Omrites, for the first time, we have strong extra-biblical evidence, and I think that we need, we need to specify this um, uh, textual evidence for their time. First and foremost among them is the famous uh, inscription stele of uh, Shalmaneser III, uh, king of Assyria, describing the confrontation of Assyria with the coalition of uh, kingdoms of the Levant um, at Karkar, the Battle of Karkar, which is in the north, about, what should I say, 400 kilometers or so to the north of Samaria, the capital, in the Bekaa of Lebanon, in the Valley of Lebanon. Uh, this confrontation took place in 853 BC. And Shalmaneser gives us a very detailed account, especially of the opponents of Assyria in the Battle of Karkar. And uh, there is no question that the most prominent and powerful monarch in the coalition, in the, in the anti Assyrian coalition at Karkar, was, was Ahab who is described as Ahab the Israelite. So in parenthesis, I should say that here we get the first ref reference to Israel in extra biblical text after many years, after several centuries. And we remember, of course, the Merneptah stele around 1200 BC, and we are in 850. So this is the first time after 350 years that we have the reference to Israel. Ahab the Israelite, he comes to the Battle of Karkar, Kar Kar, with a force of 2,000 chariots. This is a huge force, if you can imagine the number of horses needed for such a powerful army. Even if Shalmaneser exaggerates, relatively speaking, Ahab is the most powerful there with his army at Karkar, so far to the north of the Northern Kingdom. Then we have the famous Mesha Stili, uh, found uh, uh, east of the Dead Sea in the late 19th uh, century uh, at uh, Dibon, uh, possibly the capital of Moab, written by Mesha, king of uh, Moab, who is also mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. And he tells the story of the conquest of territories to his north by the kingdom of Israel in the time of Omri and his son. And he even refers uh, specifically to the places which were built by the Omri dynasty, by the Northern Kingdom, by the Kingdom of Israel uh, in the northern part of Moab, Moab, according to his perspective, let's say. So in the northern part of the territory that will later become Greater Moab. And he tells the story and says that finally 
you know, with the help of his uh, powerful god uh, Kemosh, he managed to uh, throw the yoke of the Omrites and expand to the north and uh, send them away and take over the territories which were ruled by the Omrites uh, in the first half of the ninth century. The third extra biblical text, no less important, is the inscription that uh, was discovered about 25 years ago at Dan, in the northern part of Israel today, Tel Dan, uh, biblical Dan. And uh, this inscription uh, was established there, apparently another stele. Uh, the inscription the stele is broken, so we have one piece of it. Well, uh, king of Damascus, apparently Hazael, is describing his uh, victory over uh, the kingdom of Israel. And he starts by mentioning uh, the time of Hazael. He ruled between around 840 and 800 BC. I'm giving it approximately the years, okay? And he speaks uh, in the beginning, apparently, of the study. He gives legitimacy to his push in the direction of the northern kingdom and conquest of territories from the northern kingdom by saying that the kings of the northern kingdom, before his time, took over territories of Damascus in the, in the north. So we have another evidence in, uh, for the power of the northern kingdom. Hazael speaks about his victory over Joram, the king of... Uh, Israel in uh, probably in a battle that is referred to in the Bible in 841 BC. So the Omerides are obviously uh, a big powerhouse in the southern Levant and a big player on the international scene as well. What does the Bible say about them? We have uh, a lot of information in the Bible. The question is that we have to sort it out and see what's exactly historical because uh, much of it comes from the prophetic circles. But before uh, speaking about this, let me say that, uh, first of all, the Deuteronomistic historian hates them. He hates the Omrites. He is negative to all northern monarchs, and especially to uh, the um, Omrites, and especially specifically to King Ahab. And this raises the question whether he, the Deuteronomistic historian, who is writing uh, a long time after King Ahab, uh, King Ahab is in the first half of the ninth century, and the Deuteronomistic historian is active uh, 200 years later, but the question is whether there is still a memory of the big power of the Omrides, a memory of confrontation of the Omrides with the southern kingdom, with Judah, and whether this, the greatness of the Omrides, uh, in the eyes perhaps of Israelites who are living in Judah and Jerusalem at that time of the Deuteronomistic historian, whether this is the reason for the, this animosity to the um, Omride the monarchs uh, in the text. In any event, uh, the much of what we know about the Omride dynasty comes from the prophetic circles of Elijah and Elisha in the Book of Kings, and there are many details there. However, uh, this material was put in writing uh, later than the time of the Omrites, and there is a big discussion in biblical circles, biblical research, critical biblical research circles, whether uh, this, uh, how, how historical this uh, part of the biblical text is, and when exactly later than the Omrites uh, it was indeed put in writing, some say a very long time later. One thing is for sure that the text is confused. And this can be seen very easily when we try to understand the stories about the confrontations with Damascus, because there are several phases there. And the confrontation with Damascus appears in several places. And uh, it is very difficult to make sense of these places if we follow exactly the biblical sequence in the Book of Kings. However, uh, if we try to put it together in view of what we know from the uh, point of view of the ancient Near East and archaeology, maybe it is possible to put some sense in uh, this story of the uh, struggle with the Damascus in the time of the Omrides. Uh, in fact, starting in the time of the late Omrides, because in the time of Ahab there is no evidence for this confrontation, it starts a little bit uh, later, 
It, uh, I'm speaking about uh, the Battle of Ramot Gilead in 841 uh, BC, which brought about the fall of the Omride uh, mini empire, uh, if I may say so. And then what happens next, the decline of Israel, the pressure of Damascus on Israel, and the re-emergence of Israel uh, uh, in the very late 9th century BC. Anyway, there is big confusion there, and not uh, all this text uh, refers to the time of the Omrites. However, in the prophetic circles at the same time, we do have pieces of evidence which are fully historical. For instance, we have the story about uh, Jezreel. We have the story about the Battle of Ramot Gilead in 841 BC, the decline of the Northern Kingdom and the rise, temporary rise of Damascus um, to uh, power as another mini empire in the second half of the ninth century. So basically, we should uh, try to put all this together in order to evaluate the situation. And I think that even if uh, big parts of these stories were put in writing far later than the time of the Omrites, perhaps starting in the time of the Nimshites, this is the dynasty that replaced the Omrite dynasty in the Northern Kingdom, and then edited time and again later, still there is valuable information there. Archaeology has a lot to contribute to this period as well. Archaeology tells us really a lot about the Omrite dynasty, and this is of course uh, reasonable because the Omrites were, they were strong uh, monarchs and also very um, obvious uh, builders. And when it comes to monarchs who are into uh, building activities, we archaeologists uh, should be able to identify them in the field. So about the Omri dynasty, we really know a lot uh, from different uh, perspectives. First of all, Samaria. The Bible tells us the story that in the beginning, the capital of the Northern Kingdom was not at uh, Samaria. It was first possibly at Chechem and then at Tirza, uh, north uh, east of Chechem, still in the highlands. And uh, I think it is possible to identify a phase in the archaeology of Tirza, which uh, may fit well the time, uh, the period of time which we described in our previous conversation of the first 50 years of the Northern Kingdom. But then the Bible says that Omri, the founder of the the Omri dynasty uh, decided to move his capital to a new place and he purchased the, uh, this uh, place that became the uh, capital of Samaria uh, from Shemer, uh, uh, a figure, you know, probably having some sort of a farmhouse uh, on a hill there in the western part uh, of the highlands, which means northwest of uh, Shechem. And this is already a clue that perhaps the northern kingdom in the time of the Omrites is already interested not only in the highlands but also in what happens uh, to the west uh, in the coastal plain and also the connection with maybe one of the ports of the coastal plain. And at Samaria there is very strong evidence because we see the ruling compound which was excavated, had been excavated many years ago by the Harvard expedition in the beginning of the 20th century. Very beautiful construction building activity. I mean, uh, the remains of the palace of the kings of Israel at Samaria, excavated by Harvard over a century ago, until today is the biggest and most elaborate single uh, building of the Iron Age anywhere in the Southern Levant. And this is really very impressive. And we can date that to the time of the Omeride dynasty? Not so easily at Samaria. Without the Bible, it would have been quite difficult for the simple reason that uh, Samaria was inhabited uh, also later uh, in the later phases of the Northern Kingdom and then after the fall of the Northern Kingdom and then in the Hellenistic period. And then it became a very important site, Sebaste, built by Herod the Great in the early Roman period. So. Uh, the archaeology of Samaria is quite confused and very difficult to decipher. However, I suppose that uh, perhaps it would be, after all, possible to identify Omride architecture 
at Samaria when we compare some of the features to what we see at Megiddo, for instance. And at Megiddo, we are well dated. So this is the way maybe to put some order into the archaeology of Samaria. In any event, Samaria is very beautiful. There is this compound, elevated compound there, built with the big effort of uh, fields and uh, support walls and the royal compound on top. Uh, people who probably approached Samaria from far away were impressed by the view of the uh, palace of the kings of Israel on the, on the hill. Then we have, of course, Jezreel, which is also very important. The uh, royal compound at Jezreel is mentioned in a way in the Book of Kings and the excavations of uh, Tel Aviv University, David Yosishkin, at uh, Jezreel 25, 30 years ago, indeed revealed uh, a very elaborate uh, compound there, which is possible, archaeologically speaking, indeed to date to the phase of the, big, of the Iron Age, which fits well the first half of the ninth century, the time of the Omri dynasty. Then we should, I think, uh, mention that uh, the Omrites uh, managed to uh, expand from the Jezreel Valley farther to the north in our pre previous conversation when we described the boundaries of the Northern Kingdom in the beginning, in the first 50 years, we say that they managed to rule only in the north until the valley, until the Jezreel Valley, until Megiddo, let's say, not into the Galilee and the northern Jordan Valley or in the direction of Damascus. However, in the time of the Omrites, uh, until it, is, it would be fair to say that we have evidence for expansion of uh, this dynasty farther to the north into the hilly Galilee and also along the northern part of the Jordan Valley, at least to Hazor. The archaeology of Hazor in the north, excavated first by uh, Iga Eliadin of the Hebrew University and then later again uh, by Bento, uh, there is evidence there, I think, uh, to be, I mean, there is a phase at Hazor that can be identified, I think, quite safely with the time of the Omri dynasty. So we see already this expansion uh, in the direction, in this direction uh, to the north. When we talked about Solomon, we uh, discussed in great detail not only the stables there, but also the palaces that were associated with Solomon. At Megiddo. At Megiddo. And, w and at the time, we, we said we would discuss them again when we got to the Umari dynasty. So let's take that opportunity. Yes, so except for uh, Samaria and Jezreel and Hazor, we have the Megiddo palaces. Uh, this is a different story because Jezreel is a little bit similar to Samaria in the sense of an elevated compound, a big compound uh, with some features which uh, are similar in these places. And Hatzor in a way also, but Megiddo is a different story. At Megiddo we have the two palaces which are really beautiful and can be really securely identified, archaeologically speaking, with the first half of the 9th century, both from the point of view of relative chronology, that is to say the uh, ceramic uh, evidence and from the perspective of absolute chronology when we date these layers uh, with the, according to radiocarbon samples. So altogether the Megiddo palaces are from the 9th century and indeed uh, uh, the Megiddo palaces had been taken before as the, had been viewed as the symbol of Solomonic greatness. We can say that they symbolize very well together with the palace at Samaria the greatness uh, of the Omri dynasty. There is one thing which is really interesting between Samaria, the play between Samaria, Megiddo, and Jezreel, and uh, that is uh, that uh, uh, one of the palaces at uh, Samaria has uh, Mason's marks on the blocks. We spoke about it, I believe, when we described you know, the uh, debate uh, over uh, Solomonic Megiddo. And these uh, Mason's marks appear only in one more building in the entire region of the Southern Levant, and I'm speaking now about the palace of the Omri dynasty, palace of the Israelites at Samaria. So this makes the link between Megiddo and Samaria on one hand, and then the pottery evidence makes the link between Megiddo and Jezreel. So we have here a situation that we, we are tied very well with these three places 
Samaria in the highlands, the Jezreel in the Jezreel Valley, and Megiddo in the western Jezreel Valley in the time of the Omri dynasty. The Mesha inscription that we referred to earlier speaks of the Omeride occupation to the north of Moab. Uh, any archaeology there to go with that? Mesha indeed uh, refer not only speaks about the Israelite occupation there, and I should also say that we have hints in the Bible in a very surprising place, possibly for the expansion of the northern kingdom in the direction of Moab there in Transjordan. I refer here to the story of the conquest of uh, Heshbon, Sihon, king of Heshbon, in the book of Numbers. You'll be surprised, Matt, maybe to hear that uh, in the book of Numbers, in several places, there are embedded there memories uh, of an early phase of the history of the Northern Kingdom in Transjordan, and maybe a clue for this expansion in the direction uh, of uh, the Kingdom of Moab, uh, east of the Dead Sea. In any event, uh, Mesha specifically lists two places, Jahaz and Atarot, which were constructed by the Omrites. These are the two fortresses that he then is proud to tell us that he took over from the Omrites. And I think that the two of them are uh, easy to identify. Atarot is very easy to identify because it is called Chirbet Atarus uh, today, so the name is the same name, basically preserved. And the other place, Jahaz, is also not too difficult to be identified, and the two of them feature the same uh, typical characteristics of Omride architecture that we can identify west of the Jordan in places such as Samaria and uh, Jezreel. So we are on safe grounds, I think, describing the expansion of the Omrides uh, in Etmo, in east of the, of the Dead Sea, both from the perspective of the inscription of Mesha, textual inscription, ancient Near Eastern text, archaeology, the archaeology of the two places that we described a minute ago, and also possibly uh, hints in the biblical text. Uh, what's the reason for the construction of these forts? Was it to occupy Moab? Mm, occupation of Moab, yes, but not only. I think that uh, the reason, first of all, is the great power, the possibility. I mean, prosperity of the kingdom, economically, demographically, manpower, so this is possible. But also the challenge of uh, control over the different parts of the Northern Kingdom. We spoke about it already, that the Northern Kingdom is very different than Judah. It is. Uh, not uh, uh, so homogenic. So we are dealing with different areas. Uh, they have different geographical features. And so also, I think, ethnically, if I may say so, uh, the composition is very complex because we have the highlanders at Samaria and the, the central part of the heart, the core area of the Northern Kingdom. But then we have the people of the lowlands in the Jezreel Valley, they are a little bit different than the Highlanders. And then we have people living in the northeast uh, on the margin of Damascus and their uh, affiliation with the Israel does not go without saying. They are caught there in the middle between the two powers of Damascus and Israel and they need to be controlled one way or the other. And then in the northwest uh, we have uh, the Phoenician city-states, which were also powerful in the first half of the ninth century. So this very interesting composition map of uh, the region in the first half of the ninth century, I think, is the background for the need of control, for the need of uh, construction of major strongholds for garrison, for control over these territories. Okay. So the the Omri dynasty really features a lot of the trappings of a, of a real strong territorial kingdom. Right. Uh, do we get writing yet? <laughs> yes, uh, writing. This is the difficult question. Writing, I mean, supposedly we should see uh, scribal activity in such a powerful kingdom. I mean, we are dealing here with a kingdom which is able to, uh, sh to go with a big army all the way to Karkar in the valley of Lebanon 400 kilometers farther from Samaria to the north, uh, 
one needs some sort of administration for construction of the forts, for um, um, construction of such a big army, for control over these territories. And surprisingly, there is no evidence for writing in Hebrew in the territory of the Northern Kingdom in the first half of the ninth century. Writing in Hebrew, we spoke about it. Here we connect to one of the previous conversations. We spoke about it already. Writing in Hebrew appears a little bit later, maybe in the very late 9th century, maybe around 800 BC, but not as early as the first half of the 9th century. Is this possible? It is very difficult to accept, and this is the reason why some, some of us, some of my colleagues, uh, whom I very much respect, uh, of course, has raised the possibility that in the beginning writing was limited to papyri, and this uh, is the reason why um, we don't have any evidence because papyrus is a perishable material. I find this argument not so um, easy to accept. And why is that? Because I suppose that had there indeed been strong scribal activity in the circles of the palace on papyri, parchment, and so on, we should see some sort of uh, evidence also in the other media of writing. I refer here to uh, ostraca, to incisions, to bulle, to seals, seal impressions, and so on, and we don't. So the situation is really uh, uh, surprising, and uh, I cannot come up with a very good explanation uh, for this uh, phenomenon, for the time being, we have to try to understand the Northern Kingdom uh, in the time of the Omrites with no evidence, at least. I don't s I'm not saying that there was no scribal activity, but with no evidence of scribal activity. How about state-level cultic activity? Temples? So Indeed, forth. because we have here a very strong central uh, organization, bureaucracy, of the in, in a situation which is not very easy because they have to control those city-states uh, of the highlands, territories which are not evident as part of the central highlands in the first half of the ninth century. So how to deal with cult is a difficult question because cult, as usual, is a center of activity, of economic activity. And uh, usually very strong regional temples may signal strong regional powers uh, contesting the power of the central authority in the capital. So the Omrites, I think, needed to take over cult uh, one way or the other. So absolutely there is evidence for Omrite uh, temples. There is a, a clue in the biblical text for a temple at Samaria, and of course this should come uh, with no surprise. This is the capital of a territorial kingdom, so it should uh, uh, have uh, some sort of a dynastic temple to go with the palace uh, at Samaria. And there is also another very interesting clue in the Mesha Stili for an Israelite temple, maybe we'll refer to it in a minute, at Nebo. Uh, east of the north, east of the uh, Dead Sea. However, in other places, I think we have the first clue in the time of the Omri dynasty for indeed attempts to take over cult. And this is seen very clearly at Megiddo, our site, in the sense that uh, until around 900 BC, starting in the Bronze Age, we have a major temple at Megiddo, central power of a temple, probably with priests and activity and uh, a pilgrimage to the place and so on and so forth for the original temple at Megiddo. This continues into the beginning of the Iron Age and until around 900 BC, still in the time of, let's say, this phase which I described as the time of Baasha in one of our previous uh, conversations. However, this changes dramatically all of a sudden in the time of the Omrites because there is no more a central temple at Megiddo, cult is restricted to the central administration building. So there is, you, you can feel this power of the dynasty, control over cult. You want to engage in cult, fair enough, but in under 
uh, our control in the, with the central bureaucracy and administration. Let's talk more about the temple at Nebo. This is a uh, temple to Yahweh, if I remember correctly. Indeed, this is the temple of Yahweh, the temple of the God of Israel, according to the Mesha Stili, very clearly. Uh, Mesha describes how he took over the temple of Nebo and took the uh, objects of the, the God of Israel from this uh, temple. Um, this is interesting because, uh, and this we should say when we speak about the Omrites, in the time of the Omrites, we have the first solid evidence for the cult of the God of Israel, Yahweh, in the two Hebrew kingdoms. Uh, we have it first of all in this uh, uh, inscription of Mesha, the Mesha uh, stele from Dibon, uh, dating to the uh, second half of the ninth century, but describing events that took place in 840 BC. So describing the situation in the first half of the ninth century. And also the first Yahavistic names of monarchs in the north uh, appear in the time of the Omrites. Uh, uh, the two first uh, monarchs are uh, Ahaziah and uh, Joram. They carry the name of the Israelite uh, deity uh, in their name. And the same holds true for Judah of the time. Jehoshaphat is the first uh, monarch in Judah with the Yahavistic name. So there is solid evidence for Yahweh, the God of Israel, um, being an important uh, deity. Of course, we are not dealing still with the monotheism at that time, but uh, an important, ex at least, deity of the dynasty uh, in the time of the Omrites. And uh, here we are going into speculation, but we need to ask, you know, whether uh, uh, this deity, uh, Yahweh, appears first in the north and then by influence uh, into the south, uh, into Judah, because of the influence of the Omrites on Judah, uh, and where exactly is the origin of, of this um, uh, God of Israel. Maybe we can speak about this later. Since there's clearly some sort of, you know, Yahweh seems to connect Israel and Judah in this example of the names that you, you bring up here. Uh, uh, the northern kingdom of the Omrides is a very strong kingdom at this time. Would you say that they have some sort of influence over Judah? Absolutely. I think that uh, this connects well to our general perspective of the northern kingdom as the more powerful of the two Hebrew kingdoms. The two Hebrew kingdoms existed uh, side uh, by side for about two centuries. Let's say between 930 and 730, 720 BC. Within this period of time, for about one century, which means half of the time, Israel is the powerful uh, kingdom ruling over Judah, one way or the other. And this happens both in the first half of the ninth century and again in the first half of the eighth century. In the time of the Omrites, there is strong reason to suggest that the Omrites tried to take over the dynasty in Jerusalem. We see this in the biblical text. If we try to read the biblical text uh, naively or less so, we see that uh, Atalia, who was a queen of Omride origin, uh, after the battle of uh, Ramot Gilead and the death of Joram uh, in the battle in 841, she tries to take over the dynasty and there is this story there in the biblical text in the second book of Kings of how a priest emerges after a while. There is a coup against Atalia and a priest emerges with a real Davidite, Jehoash, who is put on the throne as a child after the, uh, this coup and the killing of, uh, of Atalia. All this story probably preserves some sort of a memory of an attempt to take over the dynasty in Jerusalem by the Omrites. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Let's, let's talk about the demise of the Omrides. Indeed, uh, the Omrides ruled and uh, established this uh, mini empire in the southern Levant uh, in the first half of the ninth century for 40 years. And there is this uh, tango here between three powers, uh, starting in fact even a little bit before. And the tango is between Israel and Damascus, the two local strong kingdoms, and big Assyria, big brother in the background. And in the first half of the ninth century, Israel is the powerful one. 
And then later, uh, uh, around uh, 840, Damascus uh, becomes very powerful because apparently the pressure of Assyria diminishes and, some, and Damascus manages to establish this um, alternative mini empire in the southern Levant in the time of Hazael, who is mentioned more than once in the biblical account. And in the battle of uh, Ramot Gilead, uh, Damascus uh, emerges as the winner, defeats Israel, and takes over big parts of the Northern Kingdom. And we see this archaeologically because we do see uh, uh, destruction layers in several places, including at Megiddo, the site that we are excavating, destruction layers that can be securely established, chronologically speaking, with the, these events in the 40s, uh, around the 840 uh, BC and a little bit later. And in fact, Hazael manages to rule over the Northern Kingdom and push the Northern Kingdom uh, into the highlands. Uh, in fact, the territory of Samaria, around Samaria. And he manages to rule over much of the territory of the Southern Levant for about uh, four decades, for about 40 years, until uh, the geopolitical situation changes again. Uh, Assyria starts expanding again. Assyria uh, puts pressure on Damascus, and this is the moment that the Northern Kingdom manages to re-emerge as a powerful kingdom uh, in the region. Of course, that will be the subject of our next conversation, so we'll save it, and I'll see you next time. Sure.